You might not think much about crossing the kitchen to grab a cookie or climb a flight of stairs, but if you try to build a robot to do those things, you'll see just how complicated these actions are. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, the world is an ocean of motion. It's more than just hoofing it. Life and nature are always on the move, from squirming bacteria to the early explosion of the cosmos. And even when you think you're taking a load off, well, physics tells you that you're not. Motion is impossible to stop. Find out what's driving us. It's What Have You Got to Move? Getting from here to there, it's a fundamental behavior of almost every living thing, even plants. After all, they turn their leaves towards the sun. Animal motion is so common, we seldom stop to consider the variety of means animals have for getting around. Swimming, slithering, leaping, flying, bounding, running, evolution has produced stunningly diverse schemes for locomotion. Imagine the world if nothing moved. Not only would pizza delivery take even longer, the planet would be a pretty stultifying place. Zoologist and science writer at the University of Cambridge, Matt Wilkinson, imagines what this might be like. If self-propulsion never had evolved, he writes, life would be nothing more than a few scattered and short-lived patches of unusually complex chemistry running and consequently on the ocean floor of an otherwise dead planet. Hey, Blob, let's check out that hot water vent. Might be new food. Nah, too much trouble. How about shimmying over to that green wavy thing then? Uh Uh-uh, I'm tired. (sighs) This place is dead. Luckily, life craves movement. From the stirring of the first bacteria to the leap of a passenger onto a commuter train, the story of life is the story of getting from point A to point B, says Dr. Wilkinson. And we do it in diverse ways, each shaped by contingent physical principles, whether terrestrial, aero, or hydrodynamic. As Dr. Wilkinson has titled his book, We are all restless creatures, beginning with our earliest origins as complex molecules hanging out near hydrothermal vents. I'm a full subscriber to this idea that life started in the oceans, um, the uh, hydrothermal vents. And I think it's a really good idea that actually the first form of life we know, if you can really even call it life at that point, was these sort of complex organic molecules within the rock of the vents. So at that point... No, certainly the life couldn't move at all. But it would have had to get going pretty soon after that because sooner or later the energy source of these vents is going to get used up. So as the crust moves away, and of course eventually it's going to get drawn down into the mantle. So it it was a very, very significant step to be able to kind of escape the womb, if you like, (laughs) of of allowed to kind of get away from where it originated. Well, it it, it sounds pretty obvious then. If you don't move, I mean, you're probably doomed, right? Because you run out of food, and and, and if you need to mate, maybe you run out of mates, I don't know. But, (laughs) right, you're kind of limited to whatever comes to you. But then again, I mean, plants do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So then there are certain... Certain aspects of it, it depends on what you're what you're subsisting on, but you might be able to find a lot of it in one place. And, you know, that's certainly true of plants. But, I mean, even for them, they need to get the next generation away. They need to get the, the pollen away. Now, of course, none of that is done on their own steam, but there are a lot of adaptations in plants which seem to be mainly concerned with that one one thing. I mean, the very origin of pollen, I would suggest, is, is a kind of adaptation for locomotion. It, it's And the, the origin of flowers, that's kind of um, bringing insects into the picture. That's how they kind of bribe them into kind of moving the pollen for them. The reason trees get so tall is partly to increase the dispersal of their seeds. So I think even for plants, it's a really, really important thing. They just had to do it in a very different way. Okay, so if uh, you were to itemize the advantages of locomotion, I mean, you know, greater access to resources, to mates, to escape danger, better invite, give me some idea why travel might be, you know, more than just a matter of broadening your personal horizons. <laughs> well, I mean, you've said the big ones. I mean, it, yeah, if, if food is distributed unequally, no, the one that can move 
is, is probably going to get a big advantage over the one that can't. Uh, and the same for escaping predators. Maybe there are other ways you can escape being eaten, but being able to actually escape, move away, is another one. Um, you have access to mates. And if, if there's any kind of local extinction, so any kind of catastrophe that just affects one local area, those that can move are more likely to be able to escape that. So you know, all of this kind of adds up. And when you think about it, now, a lot of these things, now access to food, escaping predators, access to mates, this is kind of what's going to influence more than anything else, really, how many healthy offspring you leave. And as far as natural selection is concerned, that's the only thing that matters. So I think that locomotion is going to have a very high priority, I would suggest, in the eyes of natural selection. Let's go back a bit, uh, you know, half billion years or more, and all our ancestors, <laughs> I can remember it, all our ancestors uh, were in the ocean, uh -huh. and, uh, and I think you've uh, argued that our evolution in water shaped the evolution of the vertebrate backbone. How would that have happened? Yeah, it's... Um it doesn't automatically come to you why the backbone should be sort of any good for swimming. It just seems a kind of good thing to hang everything else off. But it's kind of the critical difference between us and our worm-like ancestors. Uh, when you think about how an earthworm moves, it kind of does this telescoping movement. It gets short and fat, then long and thin. That works fine if you're burrowing, but it's a bit rubbish if you're doing anything else. And certainly if you want to swim, there are many, many better ways to do it. But to do that effectively, you need to stop your body shortening when your muscles contract. If you can do that, then you can develop this, this wave-like motion in the body. You can kind of undulate from side to side. And that's really what the backbone is primarily therefore it's to enable that swimming movement which if you like is the equivalent underwater of the evolution of flight really it just meant our ancestors were able to kind of lift off and explore this new 3d world okay so having a backbone was essential to being a good swimmer mm -hmm. uh, so so the aches i have in the morning are are due to the fact that my ancestors needed to swim around the ocean that's right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, but, but staying with aquatic animals just for a moment, um, I, I noticed that, you know, large predators in the ocean, I mean, barracudas, sharks, whatever, they all look the same. They all look like torpedoes. Yeah. Whereas the, the, the smaller critters in the ocean look like, I don't know, monsters from outer space, mostly, <laughs> if you get a post them. Why the difference there? Oh, that's a big question. It's a question of scale, uh, small scales. If you're moving through fluid, and that can actually be air or water, but let's just think about it as water, the forces of friction become much more significant. So everything's a lot more treacly, uh, a lot more like molasses when you're kind of uh, moving around. That means that, that streamlining is actually going to be worse than useless because there are all sorts of things that don't work at that sort of scale. So the idea of coasting, you know, putting a bit of energy in and then, and then kind of just sailing along, that just simply doesn't work when the environment's so treacly. So what you really need at that scale is just to try and get your overall surface area down. And the trouble with streamlining is it's fine if you're bigger and then that sort of coasting way of moving uh, works for you, but it does add area. So uh, at the small scale, it's just not going to work. So you're not going to find small streamlined things. Yeah, no, no miniature sharks, I guess. No, 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 no. Well, one more ocean-themed question. Uh, I learned from you that sponges sneeze. I, I, I must say, I, I haven't, uh, they never did that on my kitchen sink. What, what, uh, what, 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 what do you mean by that? Oh, I love this story because it's just based on an observation, but you kind of need to be aware of the scale that, or the, the time scales that sponges work on because they look pretty inert. I um, mean, they're just sitting there. Yeah, you can put some dye in the water and then you can kind of see them filtering the water and that's a very impressive thing to do. But the, apart from that, they don't really seem to be doing anything. But if you use time-lapse photography, to kind of compress you know, several hours into a, you know, a few seconds, um, a lot of them seem to do these regular pulsing contractions. And it seems that the reason they do that is to clear the pores, really. So if their body gets a little bit too gummed up with sediment, they can do a few of these and clear it so they can carry on filter feeding. But it's very, very slow. So you're only going to notice if you use time-lapse photography. And it raises all these really important questions. If it's a sponge, it doesn't have any muscle, it doesn't have any nerves. How is it coordinating these these contractions? It's um, it was a, yeah, a fantastic discovery that. You you write, Matt, that the need for mobility uh, has shaped everything from sex to the evolution of complexity. Can can you give us an example of that? Yeah, well, I mean, the sex thing comes about 
you know, because organisms need to be moving around if they're going to encounter each other. In terms of complexity, and that's partly because moving well, so moving effectively and efficiently, it's generally a pretty difficult thing to do. I mean, you're up against the unbending laws of physics there, and that will tend to require a certain sort of organisation of body, particularly if you're a bit bigger, to be able to exploit properly. So, for instance, the vast majority of animal life has left-right symmetry and sort of engines, if they're legs or, or some other sort of propulsive engine, just repeated and, and distributed down the lengths of their bodies. That requires quite a, a lot of sort of developmental organisation to be able to pull off. And also, if you're going to be moving around, you need to be able to control your movements. You need to be able to assess your environment. You need to know, you know where to go, what to avoid. And, of course, that then calls on a very complex nervous system to be able to do all that. No, oh, well, it, I can see that the challenges would be greater if you're moving around, new environments, whatever, uh, competitors. Uh, but you've also written that opposable thumbs might owe their existence to our need to move around. I mean, I, I'm thinking hitchhiking here, maybe, but but <laughs> but how, how are they a consequence of our mobility? Yeah, I mean, talk to a lot of people and they think it, well, it's a tool use thing, but you find opposable thumbs in many more species than just humans. It's um, You see it in monkeys and apes and uh, and even lemurs and the like. So it, it's, a, it's a primate thing. So primate is the, the big group that we belong to. And the um, sort of ancestral way in which it was used was to grab hold of branches when these things are moving in the trees. And it's one of these things, obviously, we don't do that anymore. Now we're on two legs. But we've inherited this opposable thumb, which we can now put to all sorts of other good uses. So it's one of these cases where what was once a locomotory adaptation has now found a use um, in all sorts of other ways. And, of course, very, very significant for us in terms of enabling us to, to operate tools and like and hitchhike. <laughs> I have to say that uh, without knowing the actual mechanisms, I am impressed by the fact that we walk upright. Not not too many animals have <laughs> have opted for that. It, it seems quite hard to do. I mean, anybody who, as a kid, has built some sort of robot, uh, or or maybe built a Dalek, if you know how to do yeah. that, you know, they're not good at walking around. They just kind of roll around, yeah. uh, and they certainly can't go up the stairs. I mean, uh, walk, walking is hard, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's a real. I mean, what we do is it's almost unique. I mean, there are, there are a lot of other two-legged things. There are things like birds and, and the dinosaurs that they evolved from uh, and kangaroos and things, but they use their whole body as a kind of a balancing rod. Now, the spine tends to be a lot more horizontal for them. Our kind of bolt-upright posture is really, really unusual. It's another inheritance from our time in the trees. Um, and the reason a lot of people think this is if you look at apes, they when they're in the trees, will tend to have their spine vertical. And it, it, it seems to be a kind of safer way of moving in the trees if you're quite big. Um, and apes obviously are, are pretty large compared to monkeys because it means they're able to kind of use their arms to kind of sort of stretch out and, and hold branches. It's a much safer way of moving around in the trees. So I think you know, more than anything else, that explains why this propensity exists in us, I think. It was something that entirely happened once we were down out of the trees. If it had just been about making movement better on, on land rather than in the trees, we could easily have improved the way we moved around on four legs, uh, which is what a lot of monkeys like baboons have done. So there's more to this. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a really difficult question. It's one that we've been asking for a very long time, why we stand upright on two legs. I don't think we've fully got there yet. Well, finally, Matt, uh... You know, in the modern era, we have machines that move us around. Uh, many of us have become quite sedentary. And, and even aside from the maybe the impact on our physical fitness, does uh, this lack of mobility have other deleterious effects? I try to turn off the GPS in my car because yeah. I, I, I figure that it's probably, you know, uh, lowering my IQ to use it. But, but <laughs> is there really any problem here? I think so. And I think it... Because we sort of started using cars so much, I think what it's doing is it's, it's distorting the way we relate to our own environment and, of course, to our own bodies. And this is more important than I think most people realise because for us, particularly because we have such a big brain, the ability to explore the environment, to wander around with our senses fully engaged, that is a, a real major source of, or potentially a major, major source of joy for us. And if you look at uh, various anthropological accounts of traditional cultures, they often draw attention to how much meaning is attached simply to the act of moving around in the environment. But we've kind of now built our environment more to reflect our car use 
which is making it very difficult for us now to actually explore where we are on our own two legs. And I think it's a bit tragic, really, that we're kind of cutting ourselves off from a major source of joy, meaning that we, we no longer really know where we live anymore in the way that our hunter-gatherer ancestors did. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear you're, you've been turning off the GPS because, of course, that's the ultimate outsourcing. We don't know how to do the physical effort anymore because we can let the car do that. We don't even have to think about where we're going because that's outsourced to, a, to the GPS device. So kind of any, whenever I see any attempt to resist this, I think that's a very positive thing. Matt Wilkinson, thanks so very much for speaking with us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Matt Wilkinson is a zoologist and science writer at the University of Cambridge. Restless Creatures is his book, The Story of Life in Ten Movements. So obviously, locomotion is essential to anything that's alive. Otherwise, you're stuck with all the resources that come to you. Well, some plants do fine, though. Yes, they do. But you notice that more things eat plants than the other way around. I mean... It's, there's something about that. They can't get away from the predator. Well, I know more of us are supposed to eat plants. Yes, well, that's right. But you've never seen a lettuce get out of the way, have you? I mean, you just don't see that, all right? But, you know, I'm just thinking, if there were a planet where there were strong winds all the time, or, or, or if you're in the water, strong ocean currents, maybe locomotion wouldn't be so important because things would come to you on a regular basis. Just a thought. Now, why is it with all of the different forms of locomotion that Dr. Wilkinson outlined, why haven't wheels evolved? I mean, we use wheels, right? That's one of our most popular forms of transportation. Why didn't they evolve naturally? Yeah, well, I used to wonder that as a kid. Why indeed are there no animals with wheels? Uh, part of the problem I thought about was how do you use muscles to spin wheels? That's kind of hard. That way the muscles get all wrapped up in the axles or something like that. But I think that the real point is that, you know, the topography doesn't really allow it. Anything that runs on wheels usually is going on very well-prepared topography, which is to say a road, a rail, something like that. You don't find that in nature in the raw when you crawl out of the oceans, you know, 300, 400 million years ago. There's no pavement waiting for you. If you could have another form of locomotion added to your repertoire, what would it be? Well, of course, all people want to fly, right? I mean, we dream about that. I never dream about, you know, having wheels, getting around like a Dalek. I don't dream that. I, I think uh, being able to better climb around the trees the way those uh, simian pals of ours are able to do. I, or I maybe leaping, bounding. Bounding? Yeah. Yeah, bounding. I, I feel kind of bounded, actually. Yes. <laughs> Well, life just had to get a move on, as we've heard. But non-living things are in motion, too. Test it for yourself in your own kitchen. It's What Have You Got to Move on Big Picture Science. We've heard about how animals have developed fins, feet, and feathers, among other appurtenances to get around. For them, it's a matter of survival. But the fact is, the whole world is in motion. Inanimate objects move too. They might not be flying, swimming, or leaping, but they might be popping. Okay, this is a glass lid. So I'll be able to watch these kernels as they pop. Oops, oops, wait, get back in there. Now, that's not just a buttery treat you hear. It's the sound of the consequences of atoms heating up and moving fast. It's a simple experiment that actually reveals profound physics, says University College London physicist Helen Chersky. In a moment, she'll explain in what ways this kitchen experiment helped power the Industrial Revolution. She says that if you take a moment to observe, everyday physics gives us insight into far more complex phenomena. For example, you can watch a storm brew even on the sunniest of days just stir some milk into your coffee or, depending on which side of the pond you reside, tea. Storm in a Teacup is Dr. Chersky's book, The Physics of Everyday Life. I'm British, so we stir milk into tea a lot, but maybe here you stir milk into coffee more. But when you stir um, milk into tea, you see this pattern. and. The same pattern actually happens up in the sky when there's a storm. You get these big rotating storms. You see this kind of swirling pattern as the two, uh, well, in the sky it's two gases, in the teacup it's two liquids, as they swirl together. And the point of the book is that, that 
once you learn these little bits of physics, the same patterns pop up in lots and lots of different places. So you can actually see a mini storm in your teacup when you're stirring it. But are these patterns caused by the same sort of uh, science, the same sort of physics? Because, you know, I can see, uh, I don't know, the Virgin Mary in a cheese sandwich, but that doesn't mean that that has anything to do with the Virgin Mary. It's just kind of a coincidence. So there are patterns about the way the world works. That's what physics is. It's understanding the patterns that make the universe tick. And so physics isn't all, you know, quantum mechanics or cosmology or anything like that. There is a lot of it in the middle that runs our everyday world and the same rules govern, you know, where the toast falls butter side down when you push it off a table and how a cyclist goes round one of those banked cycling tracks and how Sputnik went round the earth. And so the patterns are actually what physics is. There's a careful choice of patterns, but the point is you can experiment on them for yourself with the small things around you. And then the same things explain much bigger and more important things out in the real world. Well, I'm going to stick with the teacup for just a moment because I happen to have my coffee right here and as i stir it around i notice that it develops a dimple in the middle i mean it's more than a dimple it's a pretty deep central depression there and there are a bunch of bubbles at the bottom of it and so forth what's going on there well you know you can have a huge amount of fun with a teacup but sticking with the one thing you've picked up on um the first thing that's funny about that teacup is that you get those bubbles and in every other thing you do the bubbles are always at the top, right? And yet when you stir your tea, when you do that, you get that kind of pit in the middle. The bubbles go to the bottom of the pit, which is weird, right? But it tells you something really interesting. It tells you that there's this competition between the gas in the bubbles and the liquid for where they're gonna go. And basically the liquid always wins. When you've got a bubble in your tea and you're not stirring it, the bubble rises to the top because the liquid runs the race to the bottom because of gravity. But when you stir your tea in a cup, something else is going on because as you stir it, you're kind of pushing liquid up against the sides of the mug all around the outside. And the sides are kind of pushing back in because something's got to push the liquid so it doesn't just go through the uh, sides of the mug. So in that case, the liquid is trying to be out near the sides and the bubbles are losing the battle to be out near the side so they're in the middle so this is a very important thing if things are going around in circles that something has to just keep pushing them in towards the center because otherwise they just carry on off in a straight line so in your teacup what you're seeing is that as you stir something has to push the liquid in so the liquid you know kind of piles up against the outside of the teacup and then the teacup pushes it back in so it keeps going around in a circle instead of going straight through all right. Well, you write, Helen, that uh, in general, it's not a good idea to have explosions in the kitchen. I, I try and avoid them personally, uh, except for one kind of explosion where you talk about popping popcorn. And maybe you could give us uh, the, the skinny on that, because I don't know that many people understand why these little kernels of what look like ordinary corn that's been dried out in the sun suddenly turn into this bountiful <laughs> display of white fluff. The trick of popcorn is firstly that the the outer husk, the sort of hard bit on the outside, that shell, is waterproof. And that is not true for most, you know, you can have other types of corn and wheat and stuff and that the outer husk isn't waterproof in quite the same way. So the first thing is you've got a hard waterproof casing. The second thing is that on the inside, in the kernel, there is water. And so when you put your corn in a pan to heat everything up, lots of hot oil, what starts to happen is that the water on the inside evaporates. And what that means on a tiny, tiny level, it's too small to see, is that you've got all these molecules of water that were sticking to each other and they suddenly start to push out and they bounce off each other and they bounce off the walls of the husk and they bounce around because that's what temperature is. It's, it's tiny molecules bouncing faster and faster. And eventually all that thumping on the inside of the shell, you know, this thing's like a pressure cooker. It's got to hold the pressure in. And at some point it can't take it anymore. And all of those bouncing molecules on the inside that are at really, really high pressure, really hot, burst through. And then the last step in the chain is that while all that water has been bouncing around, the um, the sort of carbohydrates in the in the husk they've been getting cooked. It's brilliant. It's basically a, cooked the the corn for you, and then it all the sort of gas expands into this foam, and then you've got this beautiful foamy cooked popcorn, which then sets, and it happens so so quickly. But this is the really important principle at the bottom of it is that if you heat something up, its molecules will move faster, and the faster they're moving, the faster they'll hit 
whatever's around them and the more they'll push on it and that simple principle also gets you to you know how the internal combustion engine works and how rockets work and problems that whales have when they're breathing you know when they go especially sperm whales that dive really deep so you see this simple pattern in popcorn and then you see the same thing in cake and the internal combustion engine and wind and all this other stuff okay but the other thing you allude to here is the fact that uh, if I'm cooking popcorn in a pan, that the the lid on the pan tries to come off. You know, just yeah. <laughs> right? you've got all these popcorn molecules in there trying to push the lid off. And what? That's the same principle as a steam engine or or even the engine yeah. in my car, right? That's exactly right. So you heat up. So there's a little bit of water that will be in the pan. There's the, the air that was already in there, and that air as it gets heated up. You know, it's like bumper cars. Imagine these tiny molecules, and the more you heat them, they bounce and bounce. They're traveling faster. They hit more often, and they're pushing up on the lid. And that is exactly the start. The, the thought of the first steam engine, you know, back in 1700, whatever it was, that was that thought that this stuff is pushing. And if it's pushing, that's useful. And suddenly you can use that to drive a steam engine. And that's, I'm a big fan of steam engines. You know, the nice thing about them is they're the kind of mechanical device where you can, you can sort of see how they work. You know, if you take one apart, there's these big pistons and levers and things. And you can absolutely see, if you see the inside of a steam engine, that it's got this big chamber that is very much like a pan. And you know, the ch steam engine has a kind of tube at the front, you know, this big round cylinder that is the front of the engine. That is basically a giant kettle and it's heating water that's going through tubes you know through it and that water turns into steam in exactly the same way that the gas the molecules in the popcorn push out on the husk that steam pushes on a piston that's useful energy which is brilliant you know you're if you travel on an old-fashioned steam train you're basically traveling on a giant moving kettle and it's exactly the same principle as the popcorn as long as we're talking about the gas laws and stuff like that, what about the fact that, you know, some whales can in fact dive to very deep depths and, you know, only one in ten of them is ever wearing any scuba apparatus. How do they do that without, you know, just going unconscious or having a, their lungs collapse or something terrible happening to them? Well, the thing about these patterns that dictate how the world works is that you know, they pop up in human culture and human history and natural history as well. Animals have to use these rules, you know, they become tools, you know, and if an animal wants to survive, these are what it's got to work with. This is the way the world works when it comes to these basic physical laws. So you can see evolution dealing with the problems. In this case, it is a problem that they cause and the problem that a whale has. So we'll, we'll think about a sperm whale, which these are hunters, they come up to the surface and they breathe. And then when they dive, they're you know, hunting things like giant squid that live a long way under the surface. So a whale might dive maybe 500 meters. I think the record depth might be two kilometers. Now, water's really heavy, right? If you pick up a bucket of water, you feel it pushing down on your hands as you try and pick it up. So imagine the weight of, you know, a kilometer of water pushing down on you. And that's what's happening to the whale's lungs. They have similar physiology to us in that they have lungs. They take in oxygen at the surface. But then if they want to go hunting, what's this whale going to do? It's got these lungs, but then when it goes down deep, they're going to get squashed and squashed and squashed and squashed. And that causes a problem because if you raise oxygen, if you raise the pressure of oxygen, it actually becomes poisonous. So the gas laws cause the whale a problem. And what the whale does about it is fantastically clever. When it's breathing at the surface, it's not taking deep breaths like we would when we swim. It's storing oxygen in its muscles. And when it starts to dive, it actually shuts off its lungs. It closes it, them away from the rest of its system. So it doesn't have to worry about the pressure pushing in on them or you know expanding them when it comes back up. It just shuts off that system so it doesn't have the problem. And it's effectively breathing off the oxygen that's already stored in its muscles. Your book is full of everyday physics around us, Helen, and the way you describe it is kind of experiential. I mean, there are no equations here, there are no F equals MA, just explanations of the mechanisms. Do you find that this approach helps non-scientists realize the extent to which they can understand everyday phenomena, not just see them, but actually understand what's going on? There's two steps to physics and the first thing is the concept, you know, the concept that if you squeeze on the gas, you increase the pressure on the inside, for example. And the second thing is the mathematical description of the consequences of that concept. And you do need the mathematics to really explore the details of those consequences to do precise calculations. But you often don't need the maths just to understand the concept. And the thing is, we've, al we've already got 
the dots to join up in our everyday lives. We just haven't joined the dots yet. So I think physics has suffered from a problem that there's this you know, public perception that physics is all, oh, it's weird quantum stuff, which is really small, or it's the cosmos and it's far away and I'll never see it anyway. You know, And there's all this stuff in the middle which is actually running our everyday world. And we start with such a head start, but I don't think we've done a good job of just encouraging people to play because that's the other thing. It's not just that the stuff's there in the everyday world. It's that once you've seen it, you can try it out. You know, the teacup thing, you don't just have to believe me. You can you know, stir the tea in your teacup uh, or tap around the rim of it with a spoon. That's quite a good thing to do. And you can try it for yourself. So you, so people have direct access to these laws of physics. And then the same laws also explain these big important things. And I think there's no reason why physics has to be, you know, this far away, you have to be extremely clever in a white coat. You know, I'm just, no, physics is about clear thinking and observation of evidence. Helen Chersky, thanks so very much for speaking with us. You're very welcome. Helen Chersky is a physicist at University College London, and she's the author of Storm in a Teacup, The Physics of Everyday Life. You know, it used to be that uh, sort of uh, tabletop physics, kitchen physics, dinner table physics was all the rage. And I think people have been put off by the development of modern physics, which suggests that you really can't understand much about <laughs> physics without, you know, lots of equations and a 20-pound a, a brain. When you say it used to be, what time are you referring to? Where it used to be that tabletop physics was all the rage, what era was that? Well, that was in the era of my youth. I won't uh, define it any <laughs> better than that. But no, really, after dinner physics, you know, you do these little demos and so forth. Like what? What's an example? Well, uh, mm. This is what you grew up doing? Yeah. Well, it usually involved balancing forks and stuff like that, you know, uh, which would demonstrate centers of mass and so forth and so on. But we've gotten away from that. And really, you know, I think that part of the reason is that many people are aware that on the very small scale, the kind of intuitive physics that you can demonstrate in your kitchen doesn't work anymore. That's quantum mechanics, right? And on the very large scale, you got general relativity, which nobody understands except 12 people on the planet. So they figure that you can't compare a, a, a teacup or a coffee cup to a cyclone in the Atlantic, whereas in fact, you can. And I thought that was really kind of interesting. Do you think there are after dinner quantum mechanic mm -hmm. experiments going on? Well, in there, many households, <laughs> well, what would I, they look like? Yeah, it's a little uncertain to me whether what they would look like. Good one, yes. a little uncertain. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you're now motivated to brew some tea, or maybe you've jumped up to make popcorn. Whatever you're doing, we guarantee that you aren't sitting still, even if you're flopped on the couch. Your atoms are always moving, but physicists want to change that. Find out how low the temperature has to go to stop an atom in its tracks. Next. I thought we were already as cool as we can be. It's What Have You Got to Move on Big Picture Science. When the Inquisition challenged Galileo in 1633 about his idea that the Earth orbited the Sun, the Inquisitors insisted that the Earth was stationary. The famed astronomer left the room, reputedly mumbling, and yet it moves. Well, the motion of planets is still making news. Recently, astronomers in Belgium led a team that discovered a tiny system of seven planets orbiting a dim bulb of a star known as TRAPPIST-1. Much has been made of this system and the potential for life there. It's also true that these seven worlds exhibit some rather unusual motions. Describe these motions, Seth. Well, to begin with, their orbits around this little star are almost perfect circles. That's a little unusual. And the other thing is the length of their years, how long they take to go around. They're 
connected to one another. They know about one another's length of year. That's something called orbital resonance? That's what it is. For example, you know, maybe the length of the year for this planet here is three days. These guys are really in a tight orbit, right? But the next planet over might be exactly one and a half days, right? So the ratio there is two to one, but it's exactly two to one. We don't find that in our solar system. What's the ratio between, say, Mars and, and Earth? Well, that's also roughly two to one, but it's not exact. It's, you know, Mars goes around in two point blah, 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 whatever years, and Earth goes around the sun in one year. It's not exact, but here it is exact because they're in resonant orbits. It's a tight little family, and they're precise in the amount of time it takes them to go around the sun. Can you imagine having an orbital period of three days? Boy, our birthdays would go flying by, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, the innermost planet goes around in one and a half days. But whatever. Yes, that's right. And also, because they're so close to one another, if you were actually to look up in the sky from one of these planets, you would see the other planets as little round balls, and sometimes not so little, in the sky. Unlike, you know, if you go out and look at Mars or Venus, they just look like a point of light. So that would be pretty dramatic. And there's something called tidal locking? Yes. Because they're so close to the star that hosts them, uh, one side of each of these planets permanently faces the star and the other side permanently faces away. So it's always dark on one side and always light on the other side. Uh, That's just an inevitable result of Newtonian physics. Well, how unusual is this discovery? I mean, we found thousands of planets around other stars and dozens of Earth-like planets around other stars. Well, here you have seven planets that are roughly the same size as the Earth, all in one system, right? I mean, that doesn't mean they're Earth-like, of course. They may or may not have oceans and atmospheres, but they are so close to the Earth in size, you could imagine that they might have liquid oceans. Uh, They're close enough to their star to have the right temperatures for that. So that, you know, means that if if there was life on any of these guys, you know, rocks would slam into the planets and carry that life to the next planet over, even if it was only bacterial life. I mean, you could have a little mini uh, federation of planets here with life on all of those worlds. Do you think they could have life or, say, intelligence? Intelligent life? Well, the SETI Institute's Allen Telescope Array has been used to uh, search for signals coming from this system and will continue to be used, but so far they haven't found anything. Hey, you movers and shakers, there's good news. The world is on your side. Well, strictly speaking, it's not, at least not the moving part. You might step off the walkway onto the floor, but if you were to get up close and personal with that tile, you'd find it a seething foam of churning atoms. According to the laws of physics, we are always in motion. Hey lady, move it already. I am moving. What, haven't you read Democritus, you moron? That was only a hypothesis, you idiot. True, but Democritus' claim was proven correct. The 5th century BC Greek didn't have observational proof, but he still envisioned that everything was made of tiny units of matter, atoms, that were always in motion. Modern physics tells us that technically it's impossible to be still. Atoms, even in a rock, are not just sitting around. They're vibrating and rotating, wiggling like preschoolers. However, according to classical physics, we might be able to quiet down an atom and slow it to a standstill. I can't promise the same for preschoolers. Yeah, well, to do that, at least in the case of atoms, you'd have to cool it down to something called absolute zero, the coldest temperature that's theoretically possible, according to classical mechanics. Hey, uh, what's the temperature out, honey? It's negative 458 degrees. Ah, it's been colder. I don't care. Wear a hat. Yes, absolute zero is colder than negative 458 degrees. It is, in fact, negative 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit, or if you prefer Celsius, negative 273.15 degrees. On the Kelvin scale, absolute zero is conveniently zero. So while it may not seem like it on those winter mornings when icicles come out of your faucet, your nose, and your car won't start, there is a limit to cold. Physicists would like to reach absolute zero, but it's impossible to do, at least so far. So what is the coldest place in the universe? Well, NASA is putting the finishing touches on it right now. The Cold Atom Laboratory has the technology to freeze atoms to a billionth of a degree above absolute zero. The lab is designed to be used for experiments on the International Space Station. Now when atoms get that cold, they don't have the sense to put on parkas, but they do change their behavior. They become a new form of superfluid matter known as Bose-Einstein condensate. 
this is where the usual rules of physics are just no longer applicable. Project Manager Anita Sengupta at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory tells us what we can learn from giving atoms the very cold shoulder. Okay, Anita, that experiment in NASA's Cold Atom Laboratory is going to be very, very cold, a billionth of a degree above absolute zero. I mean, I assume it takes more than simply turning up the air conditioner to reach those gelid temperatures. How do you do it? That's correct. It's incredibly cold. So the way we do it is we use two techniques. One technique is laser cooling, where we actually push on atoms with photons from a laser beam, and that gets us to a certain temperature in the microkelvin regime. And then we use something called evaporative cooling, where we actually fire either radio frequency or microwave radiation at the atoms in order to get them to even colder temperatures. And then as they expand, they get down into the pico-Kelvin regime, which is times 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin. Now, you say evaporative cooling. For people who don't know what that is, I mean, is that the, the, the same mechanism that makes my arms feel cool uh, when I step out of the shower and the water begins to evaporate? Yes, it's essentially the same thing. So another good analogy is if you've ever had a air spray can that you use to clean your computer keyboard with, and when you spray the air from it and it starts to feel cool, that's the same analogy. Okay, so you're going down to, I don't know, a tenth or a billionth of a degree above absolute zero. I mean, how big is the area that you're cooling down here? Are we talking a deep freeze the size of a drawer, or is it smaller than that? So the overall instrument size is around the size of a ice chest, and we're going inside of the International Space Station, so that somewhat constrains how big of a volume we can occupy. But in terms of the size of the ultra-cold quantum gas cloud, it's on the order of about a centimeter in diameter. So it's the size of, a, I don't know, a die from a pair of dice. That's what you're cooling down. Pretty much, yeah. It's a little ball of atoms. All right. Can you give me an idea of just how cold that is? When I think of cold places, aside from, I don't know, maybe Antarctica or something, which is by comparison hardly cold at all, I, I think of outer space. Does space even have a temperature we can compare to? So if we think of space, um, we think of the vacuum of space, that temperature is roughly on the order of 2 degrees Kelvin. So we're basically 20 billion times colder than the temperature of space. But but if it's really a vacuum, if there's nothing in space, how can it even have a temperature? I mean, I thought temperature was simply an indication of how fast the little particles in that volume were moving around. And if there are no particles, if it's really a vacuum, does it even have a temperature? So space is not an absolute vacuum, but it's a very good vacuum. So in space, there are actually lots of particles. So there's a lot of hydrogen particles and also heavier elements. So think of uh, the solar wind, for example, it has a lot of electrons and hydrogen atoms streaming off of it. So even though there's very few of them, and that's why you have a pretty good vacuum, you can never have nothing. You can never have zero material. So you never can get to a perfect vacuum. So this is a lot colder than space. How do you even know what temperature you've reached? I mean, you know, you're not using a mercury thermometer, I assume, because we're talking about minus 459 degrees. What, what device measures such a thing? So what we actually look at is uh, we use a technique called laser absorption imaging, and that creates a shadow of where the atoms actually are. And by looking at where the atoms are at one time and where the atoms are at a different time in terms of how the cloud is expanding, we're able to determine what their speed is, and speed is essentially temperature. So the atoms in your deep freeze here that are moving really close to absolute zero, uh, obviously they're kind of sluggish, but are there any other peculiar effects of the atoms at that temperature? So when atoms get down to these really cold temperatures, they actually all start to behave like each other. They all start to behave in unison, sort of like dancers in a chorus line. And what that means is that at higher temperatures, you have a lot more random motion. At these really, really low temperatures, that randomness essentially goes away. And you can have properties such as superfluidity. So an example of what superfluidity would be if you had a, a cup filled with water and you put your spoon in it and spun around, it would essentially go around and around and around forever. And so that's because of the unique properties that atoms take at these really cold temperatures. So that is quite bizarre. I mean, uh, is there any anything beyond curiosity? And is there anything that might be potentially useful about material that be behaves that way? Well, definitely. You have to understand the fundamental physics first before you can take it to a technology application. But if we can harness the properties of atoms at these cold temperatures, we can look at things such as high temperature superconductors, right? So you have fewer energy loss mechanisms. You can have more efficient energy transfer. Okay, so that idea, the idea that you might have uh, superconducting materials, which means that 
you can put an electric current through it and you don't, you know, you don't lose any of the energy. That's usually discussed in terms of building magnetically levitated trains or, or things like that. Is, is that the kind of stuff we're talking about here? Because these are pretty low temperatures. Well, wait, if you understand the physics about how that happens, you could potentially harness it for a technology application like that in the future. Okay. And is there a big difference, honestly, Anita, in behavior between something that's at, you know, one degree above absolute zero and, and a billionth of a degree above absolute zero? I mean, if I made it to within an inch of the top of Mount Everest, I would have to ask myself, does that last inch really matter? Does this going down to a billionth of a degree really matter? It really does, because what happens is you go through a phase transition. So another analogy would be when you have water vapor, you have a gas. When you chill down the water vapor, you turn into a liquid. You go through a discontinuity. So think of the difference between what water vapor is like versus what liquid water is like. And similarly, the difference between what liquid water is like and ice. So when you go through these phase transitions, the properties of the material change completely. Okay, so this really is important. This isn't just a matter of, you know, setting a record for Guinness. No, it, you're going through a quantum phase transition. You're creating a new state of matter. And finally, Anita, uh, do you have any plans to chill out even more, or is a billionth of a degree above zero all you need to do? Cold Down Laboratory is a technology demonstration mission as well as a science mission, so we're the pathfinder for many future laser cooling experiments and for many future cold atom experiments on space. So if we had a larger vacuum chamber, for example, we would actually be able to cool it down potentially lower as well as witness how the Bose-Einstein condensate performs over many, many, many seconds. So there really is more physics to be learned if you can just cool it a bit. That's correct. Anita Sengupta. Thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. Anita Sengupta is an aerospace engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the project manager of the Cold Atom Laboratory. So on the show, we've heard a lot of examples of, of interesting motion, including locomotion of animals and how they developed all these clever ways of getting around, but also how the motion of very small things tells you something about the motion of very big things. And finally, how if you try and stop motion by cooling a bunch of atoms down to almost absolute zero, you get a whole new kind of material that in the future might be extraordinarily useful to us. Well, and to be clear, you don't stop the motion. You try to stop the motion of the atoms, but you're not able to. You get to cool them down enough so that they're very, very sluggish and they produce this weird behavior, but you can't actually get temperatures so cold that the motion of atoms stops. Yeah, well, indeed. I mean, but it's more than just a tour de force to, you know, lower things to within a billionth of a degree of absolute zero because you're creating a new form of matter. It's 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 truly amazing. It's like, you know, when I don't know, cooking was invented and you, you took advantage of very high temperatures to produce something new, a new form of matter called a, a steak, for example. You know, it all goes back to the Big Bang as most things do, because the Big Bang created time. And motion is just change of position with time. With without that, nothing would ever change. You wouldn't die, yeah, but you also would never live. So you mean with time, without time, we would not have motion? Well, that's right, because things couldn't go anywhere. I mean, they would be the same whenever you looked, because whenever you looked, it would be the same time. There would be no change. There would be no time. And you know what? There could even be universes like that where nothing ever changes. But, you know, if you study physics, you realize rather quickly that the study of statics, where things don't move, is not nearly as interesting as dynamics and kinematics, where things do move. And think about what, in fact, precipitated modern science. It was studying the motions of the planets. It wasn't studying the forces you could put on a fluted column. Well, we talked about in the show very slow movements, such as the speed of sluggish atoms that have been cooled down quite a bit. And we know that the upper limit of speed is the speed of light, but there's a lot of range in between. There is, and we're actually seldom aware of it in our daily life because we, we see things that move around at you know, the speed of walking, the speed of cars, the speed of airplanes. The atoms in this room are moving around at about the speed of sound, you know, a mile every four seconds, but you know, they don't go very far before they bump into things. And then again, you can imagine a time-lapse photo of the Earth spanning billions of years, and you would see continents moving around at the speed of which your thumbnail grows. Motion on all scales.
Thanks to the people who are always on the go while helping us produce this show, senior producer Gary Niederhoff, operations manager Barbara Vance, and intern Sarah McQuaid. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including studying the properties of nearby asteroids. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to What Have You Got to Move? If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because it really moves you, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And hey, if you listen to our show via iTunes, we invite you to leave a review on our iTunes page. Hey, come on, I said move your car. There, how's that? You didn't even budge, move. Okay, there. Move your car. Oh, more? How about that?